just a moment. But first, I really did want to share one really interesting thing that I learned about Fred uh, just last week. And it really speaks to the impact of the ARC and it speaks to really the impact of people with disabilities. When Fred was a teenager, he worked as a summer camp counselor um, at the ARC. So clearly uh, that, was his, that was his first involvement with the organization. Uh, and clearly something there definitely struck a chord early on. Because then Fred went on to join the national board of the ARC in 2012. He also served as chair of the policy and positions committee. Uh, Fred has also served on the legal advocacy subcommittee and on the ad hoc committee on planned communities and other residential alternatives for people with IDD. And Fred, as you may know, also previously served as the president of the ARC of Massachusetts. And on top of all that, in addition to Fred's work, at the ARC, Fred is a trust and a state lawyer with over 30 years of experience representing families. Hi, Fred. Thank you, Kristen. And it has been a long time since I was a teenager. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. It, it is my honor and, and privilege uh, to welcome all of you to this virtual town hall meeting for self-advocates, for family caregivers and service providers. And thank you for taking the initiative to attend this meeting, to learn about the ARC's response uh, to the pandemic and the challenges that remain, as well as to receive a briefing on the, the new strategic framework for the future of the ARC. You know, we come together at a time in the midst of a deadly global pandemic, an uneven economic downturn impacting millions of American families, and domestic unrest over policing practices impacting communities of color. This triad of troubles has exposed weaknesses in our healthcare systems, demonstrated great disparities in our uh, income and wealth and, and widespread polarization throughout our nation. Unfortunately, these circumstances have, uh, these challenging circumstances have had a disproportionate impact on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Throughout this period of unprecedented challenges, I am so proud of the heroic and life-saving work at all levels of the ARC, national, state, and local, that has made such a huge positive difference in the lives of individuals with IDD and their families. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Julie Ward, Shira Washlog, and Claire Manning of the ongoing work of the ARC's national office and our chapters across the country in meeting these current challenges. For those of you who have been around the ARC community, our organization's response really doesn't come, doesn't come as a surprise. It's what we do. Since our founding, our mission has been to promote and protect the human rights of persons with intellectual developmental disabilities and actively support their full inclusion and participation in their communities throughout their lifetimes. We have changed lives for over 70 years Yet despite all of our gains, we have many, many challenges, long waiting lists for services and supports, you know, the lack of employment opportunities for persons with IDD, the inadequate wage base uh, of direct support workers, continued efforts to end the Affordable Care Act, to just mention a few. Such is the nature, however, of an organization committed to social change as is the ARC. There'll always be challenges and it's our responsibility to continue to gain power as an organization to meet the challenges of today and of tomorrow. I believe Reverend Martin Luther King captured the notion perfectly when he wrote, quote, power properly understood is nothing but the ability to achieve purpose. It is the strength required to bring about social, political and economic change. End quote. A key objective of the, of the ARC's new strategic framework is to organize and mobilize a powerful movement to bring about needed change on behalf of individuals with IDD, their family members, and their supporters. Given the current challenges we are facing, the ARC's new strategic framework for the future is incredibly relevant and important. The new strategic framework for the future of the ARC invites us, no, really demands of us uh, to begin to reimagine what our nation 
and what will look like can and will look like when we achieve our mission of full inclusion and participation of people with intellectual developmental disabilities in their community. It's a future where people with IDD are valued members of their community with opportunities to achieve their potential. It's a future where we as a nation value the humanity of the individual and is a future where we act both individually and collectively in the public and private sector in accordance with those values. There's much work to be done and we look forward to your active and strong contributions to this effort. So thank you. And again, for participating in this town hall and I'll turn it back to Kristen. Okay, thank you, Fred. So now we wanna move on to our panelists and I work very closely with these three very determined and dedicated advocates nearly every day. Um, they are really key in the ARC's response to COVID-19 uh, in addition to the rest of our team. So Claire Manning is the Director of Advocacy and Mobilization. Shira Walkschlag is Senior Director of Legal Advocacy and General Counsel at the ARC. And Julie Ward is Senior Executive Officer of Public Policy. So this afternoon, we wanna start with Julie. Hey there. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, good afternoon. As uh, Kristen mentioned, I serve as the Senior Executive Officer for Public Policy. And I lead a five member team of extremely experienced, knowledgeable and passionate advocates for people with IDD. Our role at the ARC is to influence public policy by raising concerns and solutions to Congress and the administration and to fight to protect the rights of people with disabilities and ensure that our needs are being addressed by policymakers. I want to begin to just briefly acknowledge uh, the lives lost due to the pandemic, the illness that is widespread and whose future impact remains unknown, the loss of services and supports that people with IDD need to live in the community, the pressure and the very difficult choices that families are facing, the loss of jobs and economic security, the strain on the service delivery system and on the direct support professionals that provide urgently needed supports. In the last six months, we have focused on raising these issues to Congress and demanding action. We have been supported by the incredible resiliency of the ARC network, people with disabilities and their families. Our communications team has gained national media to these issues, which helps us make our case with Congress and the administration. Three COVID relief packages have passed Congress but the last one passed on March 27th. That's over six months ago. We've had some small victories in these packages, but we continue to really push. While current negotiations for future packages have started and stopped and started and stopped again, we have been encouraged that the House has included dedicated funding for Medicaid home and community-based services which is one of our top asks since March, since it will stabilize the entire support system. I just wanna briefly mention our priority issues. They have been dedicated funding for HCBS and access to personal protective equipment for um, DSPs and other workforce issues. We wanna see stimulus payments made to all without barriers. And we've been advocating for paid leave for caregivers without limitations. These are just the top line issues that we've been working with our grassroots about. We've also been working tirelessly, tirelessly on a wide range of related issues, including access to healthcare, housing, special education funding, social security payments, and many, many other issues. All the other important work that we've been um, doing on an ongoing basis is working with the administration, working on implementing the provisions that have passed and on recommending improvements and addressing issues that have arisen. We've been in constant contact with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which oversees the Medicaid program and, for many, and with many other federal agencies, which are crucial to the lives of people 
with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Our team will continue fighting for action on these urgent issues and will take every opportunity to raise the issues faced by our community and to demand action. I know in a few minutes we'll have time for questions and answers. Um, right now, I'm going to turn it back uh, to Shira to talk about another important aspect of our advocacy. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. Back in March, we learned that the country may become overwhelmed by the pandemic and hospitals could reach capacity and begin having to ration medical care. This set off alarm bells in the disability community that people with disabilities would be denied access to care given a long history of experiencing discrimination. Since late March, the ARC has worked with state and national partners to file 12 complaints with the US Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights or OCR to challenge discriminatory crisis standard of care plans, hospital no visitor policies and inaccessible COVID testing sites in states across the country. There are several common issues in the crisis standard of care plans we've challenged, including categorical exclusions based on disability diagnosis, exclusions from treatment based on assumptions regarding greater time or resources required for recovery or projected lifespan, failure to modify triage assessment tools to avoid penalizing people with disabilities, allowing reallocation of personal ventilators to another patient deemed more likely to benefit from treatment, and a disproportionate impact on Black, Native, and Latinx communities. We've also challenged hospital no visitor policies and acted to prevent COVID spread that discriminate against people with disabilities by denying them effective communication needed to make informed decisions and provide informed consent, leading to the denial of necessary medical care. Finally, we've challenged the state's failure to accommodate people with disabilities and its COVID testing program by requiring the ability to access and use the internet to complete pre-screening and the ability to drive to a testing site. Things that many with disabilities, particularly those living in congregate settings or with vision disabilities do not have access to. Within a week of filing our first complaint in March, OCR issued a bulletin strongly reinforcing the prohibition against medical discrimination during COVID and has since reached favorable resolutions in four states with additional investigations ongoing. Highlights from these resolutions include Alabama withdrawing its plan, excluding those with profound intellectual disability from treatment, Connecticut revising its no visitor policy to allow family members or other supporters to accompany patients with disabilities to the hospital and provide them with necessary PPE, and Tennessee and Utah removing all categorical exclusions based on disability or resource intensity, eliminating long-term survivability considerations, requiring reasonable modifications for triage assessment tools and no visitor policies, and prohibiting the reallocation of personal ventilators. There's much left to be done, and we're optimistic that we'll continue to make progress in the coming months. So please stay tuned for future developments. And now on to Claire. Thanks so much, Jara. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Manning the Director of Advocacy and Mobilization at the ARC of the United States. I'm very excited to be with you all this afternoon and very grateful to all of you. I know everyone is very busy. There's a lot going on. So very thankful for the time that you're taking to be with us. In my role at the ARC, I work with chapters, people with disabilities and families all across the country to make their voices heard on issues that are critical to our community often what we call grassroots advocacy, working to make sure that the people who are most impacted or are going to be most impacted by a policy or an issue are at the forefront and are able to connect with policymakers, share their stories, and really have an impact. So back in March, when the pandemic was just beginning, we knew that people with disabilities we're going to be disproportionately impacted. And we knew that we were going to need to fight hard and advocate for key legislation, all of the priorities that Julie just mentioned, and we needed everybody on board. So we created a campaign called hashtag we are essential. Hopefully you've seen it. Um, and it's really aimed to focus on the needs of people with disabilities, 
their families, and the direct support professional workforce that is so critical. This campaign is ongoing. As Julie mentioned, several bills have passed, but not for a long time. Um, and it has many different components from the efforts on Capitol Hill, the work of our communications team, social media, days of action that we've organized closely with coalition partners and all of you, and much, much more. We focused uh, in the We Are Essential campaign a great deal on stories, working with individuals with disabilities and families to make sure that the stories of how real people's lives are being impacted every single day by this pandemic are getting in front of lawmakers, getting in front of legislators, getting in front of the media. We know that personal stories are one of the most powerful advocacy tools that we have. Another big component of the campaign has been the hard work of all of you. Using our action alerts, we have encouraged and asked advocates to call, text, email their members of Congress, and urge them to pass legislation that includes the key priorities for our communities. Your members of Congress work for you. They need to hear from you. And I'm very happy to share that so far, we have over 122,000, 122,000, that's an incredible number, tracked contacts, tracked calls, emails, and text to members of Congress from the ARC community. That is incredibly powerful. I know it will have a big impact. So a huge thank you to all of you for your advocacy during this very scary and very difficult time. Kristen, I'll turn it back to you now. Okay, thanks to all of you and all of the, the hard work um, that you do. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm Senior Communications Manager uh, in the National Office. And I wanted to share with you that um, during the pandemic, journalists have been, been very interested in covering how uh, COVID-19 has impacted the lives of people with disabilities, how it has affected uh, families and also the direct support workforce. And so in addition to offering perspectives from within our national office, um, we've worked really hard to try to connect uh, reporters and producers and, and writers straight to the source for their stories. So that's meaning uh, people who are directly um, impacted by the isolation, by the fears about the virus and by the important needs of service providers and um, the experiences of people you know, uh, who are being treated in, in hospitals for COVID-19. So from the Washington Post, the New York Times, NBC and NPR, and that's just to name a few, the very serious impacts of the pandemic on the disability community have been really compelling to the media. Um, and that we think has raised public awareness about the issues that are really important to us. And it's also supported our advocacy efforts. So I wanna to get to questions now. I see that we have um, a few in the Q&A and we welcome you to continue to submit those. Um, these can be questions for any of us here, for Julie, Shira, Claire, and myself, and I'll do my best to get to them. Um, and there will also be an opportunity to ask questions later. So the first question uh, is for Julie. Uh, we know that state budgets are in trouble right now after you know all of this. So we're wondering if possible tax revenue losses, et cetera, how does that impact services for people with IDD? Well, thank you, Kristen. Um, we are extremely concerned about um, this issue because we know there will be a major impact on state and local governments due to the decreased tax revenue and the many competing spending needs that the state and localities are facing. Um, we have to prepare ourselves for major challenges in the states and in the federal government. But our, our strong advocacy will be needed more than ever as these legislatures face a shortage of funds and will be looking to cut wherever they can. That's why we've been really fighting on the federal level um, to ensure that the federal government provide more state relief and also more federal matching for the Medicaid program. We have urgently advocated for that in all of the bills that have passed and in the um, pending negotiations. 
And we're talking about more money for Medicaid in addition to dedicated funding for HCBS. Um, states will need that, that extra help um, to meet their challenges. And frankly, uh, we will just need more people to get involved and to speak up about the challenges. It will take all of us working on the federal level, our state and local chapters, and all of the advocates and supporters that we can rally to make sure that our voices are heard and keep our programs from being cut very deeply. Yeah, okay. I know it's a, it's a lot, it's a, it's a team effort. It's a lot of work. Thanks, Julie. Um, so Shira, I wanted to also ask you about uh, legal advocacy. And you know, the ARC has really fortunately um, seen a lot of victories in its work fighting medical discrimination and particularly um, during COVID-19 uh, through resolutions with specific states. So do these resolutions have a broader impact beyond the states that we're talking about uh, and beyond, beyond the states that are directly involved? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Absolutely. Um, OCR quickly put out a bulletin that applied nationwide stating that disability rights laws continue to apply during the pandemic and outlining obligations of states and hospitals to comply with these laws. Uh, following the state specific resolutions I mentioned above that were with OCR and also the extensive media coverage of these resolutions, we've seen some states be more willing to engage with disability advocates on these issues and be more proactive about changing their policies. And we've also seen a greater awareness of people with disabilities and their supporters about how to enforce their rights. Uh, having examples of policies that comply with disability rights laws help states and hospitals understand concretely what their obligations are and how to modify their policies without having to reinvent the wheel. So we've definitely seen uh, a larger national impact beyond the specific states that have reached resolutions with, a with OCR. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you, Shira. Um, question about advocacy. Claire. Um, so as an advocate, I think it can be frustrating, you know, to really not know, like, you're advocating for something, you're writing to your members, and you're not really sure, like, what, like, is anyone getting this? I mean, you get like an automated reply, and then you don't really know what happens next. So I think that can be frustrating for people to not always see the direct, um, immediate impact, right, of reaching out to your members of Congress and expressing your point of view. So what, what do you say to that? I say, I, I get it. It, it can be frustrating. It can be difficult to see, especially in these, you know, very hyper partisan times that, that we're living in. Um, but it's really important to understand that it's not just your outreach alone, that it's not just your phone call or your email, um, but that it gets combined with the hundreds of people on this this call right now that, that took time out of the middle of their day to be part of this. Um, the thousands of people back home who, who weren't able to. Um, and it's our entire movement. A long time ago, I, I used to work um, as a legislative aide for a state representative in New Jersey. And we would get calls and emails all day long from constituents about different issues. And the minute we, we just kind of had like a, like a ticker and the minute we got to 15, we would basically stop what we were doing on a, on a particular issue. We would stop what we were doing and we would write a memo. We would research, what is this issue? Who's supporting it? What's going on? Um, and give it to uh, the state rep that we were working for. So I, I think it's really important that it can feel like members of Congress or your state reps don't care or aren't interested, but they absolutely do. Um, they care a lot about what their constituents think. They need to hear from you. They work for you. Um, and so I think when you're feeling frustrated to remind yourself that your outreach, you're not alone, um, that we are all in this together. We are part of this movement together um, and think about your phone calls and your outreach as one little piece of moving that ball forward. Yes, and sometimes it's hard to remember that, but coming from you, from someone who's like in it, you realize like, okay, at 15, this is what happens. So it matters, it really matters. Um, Claire, another question for you uh, coming from uh, someone who is here with us this afternoon. How is the ARC helping to promote voting among people with disabilities and their families? And we know that 
you know, it's critical. It's like, this is the time. Absolutely. That, that is a great question. Um, you know, there, people with disabilities face a lot of challenges in voting. Um, there's a lot of accessibility issues around voting. Um, of course, there's issues with guardianship and a lot of the systemic issues that already exist are going to be um, magnified by the pandemic this year. Voting is going to be difficult for everyone and it's so important that we plan and we vote early. The ARC has a lot of um, useful resources. You can, I'll type this into the chat in a moment, but you can find them at thearc.org slash vote. We have plain language materials that are available in English and Spanish, in designed and Word documents that are accessible to screen readers. Um, they have information about kind of what voting is, how to do it. Um, and we also have the ability for individuals to register to vote, look up their registration, find their polling location, information about their specific vote voting situation in their state at the arc.org slash register to vote. Okay, that's all really important. Um, this question is, I think for Julie, will the ARC be spending time advocating for marriage equality uh, with the disabled community in the near future? Uh, please and thank you, team. Um, thank you, uh, this is a really critical issue. And I, I think I, I'd like to just spend a minute about it because even though we've been completely focused on COVID and trying to get Congress to respond to that, there are also other behind the scenes um, advocacy that's going on on a lot of different issues. And so many of the things that we had been working on and making progress on at the beginning of the year just kind of came to a halt because of COVID response. Um, the marriage penalty issue is something that we hear about at every forum we do. We know how heartbreaking it is to have um, these barriers to people living a, a full and whole life um, built into many of the laws um, that we depend on. Um, there has been some progress in terms of legislation being introduced. There's been heightened interest by members of Congress. Um, so there's some behind the scenes work going on that's really um, trying to pull together a piece of legislation that addresses all of the laws and is comprehensive, but doesn't result in people um, losing access to healthcare or other benefits. It's, it's a very complicated um, issue because of the way the laws have developed over the years, but we are working on it. It has not been a front and center issue for us because we've wanted to be really, really focused on getting our top issues um, considered, but it is like many other issues that we were working on and we continue to work on and we're trying to capitalize on the interests that we're seeing from members of Congress in both parties about disability issues and bringing these issues to the surface. So, you know, of course I can't say we've made the type of progress that I, I wish we had made, but I, I do want to assure people that we do continue to work on these other issues. Yeah, and those other issues are always important to us. But Julie, following up on that in terms of like our advocacy related to COVID-19, where do you see that we have made progress over the past several months? I think that we have actually made tremendous progress um, in really creating a better understanding of what home and community-based services um, means to policymakers. We've really built on the advocacy that we had done in 2017, um, fighting against the Medicaid block grants. We knew at that point that Congress needed a lot of educating. Um, so we have spent a lot of time doing that. We've had this tremendous response from the grassroots, um, thanks to Claire's hard work, people telling their stories. It has helped us um, gain bipartisan support, um, particularly in the Senate. And you know, we haven't had the victory that we wanted in the Senate, but we've been assured that people are listening. You know, we've really been caught in the politics of an election year where Congress just can't decide on what their strategy should be or how broad their, um, their response should be. So I, I want to assure people that we're really making progress in helping Congress to understand these issues and move them forward. 
um, relief was provided in the House bills that had passed, um, the last two bills that have passed. We just haven't gotten it over the finish line. And sometimes it, it just takes like our persistence, right? Yes, it does. <laughs> Which we have. Um, so to sort of shift a little bit, uh, Shira, I wanted to ask you about our legal advocacy because it's been it's been extremely um, important over the past several months uh, as we are living through a pandemic. So I'm curious about um, some of the other ways that maybe the ARC's legal advocacy team has fought against disability discrimination uh, during COVID-19, aside from the OCR complaints, which are very important. But can you can you talk about some of the other some of the other ways that we have had an impact? Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the complaints have definitely been a big focus, but we've also pursued some other advocacy avenues um, for COVID advocacy um, over the last several months. So uh, one, one big thing that we did back in April, along with 30 other state and national groups, uh, the ARC filed an amicus brief before the Wisconsin Supreme Court in a case challenging the state's extension of the stay at home order. And that brief explained that if the stay at home order was lifted prematurely, this would disproportionately harm people with disabilities, older adults and people of color who face higher risk of contracting the virus in a life threatening capacity. Unfortunately, in that case, the court allowed the order to be lifted with no alternative plan in place to cont contain the spread of the virus. Um, but we did you know, try everything we could to help uh, put the disability view and perspective there before the court. Um, in addition to that brief, we've also provided technical assistance to the many individuals who have reached out to us regarding instances of medical discrimination on an individual basis and developed resources for stakeholders in evaluating crisis standard of care plans to determine whether they comply with federal law. Uh, and we're regularly updating these resources and putting new ones out. Um, so I did put in the chat that you can sign up for our newsletter to get updates on those uh, when we put new materials out. Uh, and they're also available on our website. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Frank, and I think it's a question that a lot of people have is how do they get involved? Like how do they do something? And so Claire, I think this is a perfect question for you. Um, what should grassroots advocates be doing right now uh, what kinds of actions should people be taking? That's my favorite question. <laughs> um, there's, there's really, I mean, there's a lot going on this year, right? But there's, there's three big things that we are asking everyone to do um, right now. One is even if you already have, go to the arc.org slash action. And I will, I will type this into the chat again um, and contact your members of Congress in any way that you feel comfortable, whether it's a phone call, an email, a tweet, you can use our system. We have sample talking points um, to ask them to pass COVID legislation that supports people with disabilities, their families and direct support professionals. That's number one. Number two um, is complete the census. The census um, we have until October 31st directs billions of dollars in federal funding that supports people, key programs for people with disabilities. It just takes a couple of minutes to answer a few questions about everybody um, living in your household. So please take a few minutes and do that. That impacts the disability community for 10 years. And then three, we've already touched on this, but vote, vote, vote. At whether it's the local, state, or federal government, every single day, government elected officials make decisions about people's lives that impact our community. Um, it's really important that everybody has their voice heard and that you are choosing the people who represent you. Um, so again, we have that website, um, the arc.org slash vote and the arc.org slash register to vote. Okay, thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, so I'm going to move on for now, but again, uh, we will have a second round of Q&A coming up and comments in just a little bit. So first though, I wanted to introduce Peter Burns. He is the CEO of the ARCS National Office, and over the past 18 months, Peter has really facilitated the development of the new strategic framework for the future of the ARC, which I referred to earlier. And he's worked closely with our long range strategic planning committee and board of directors. Uh, Peter has led the ARC since July, 2008. And under his leadership, 
uh, the ARC has charted an ambitious course of progress, innovation, and change to advance uh, the human rights of people with IDD. Before joining the ARC, Peter was executive director of the Maryland Association of Nonprofits, a nonprofit organization. He also organizations. He also served as CEO of the Standards for Excellence Institute, and interestingly, as a public interest attorney. Early or earlier in his career, uh, he won a major victory in a class action suit that reforms state and federal Medicaid regulations, which we know is critical for, for our population, for us. Uh, and, and, and those reforms were really critical in improving life for persons with disabilities and their families. Peter and Fred, and Fred's going to come back now, they are going to lay out the new strategic framework. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, nice to be back. Well, you've just heard about the ARC's efforts on multiple fronts to support folks with IDD, their families, support providers, and others to weather the storm that we've, we've all been in. And obviously the fight is, is far from over. And at the same time as all of this has been going on, we recognize a need to, to plan for the future, our 10 year uh, uh, long range plan was sunsetting uh, this year. And so uh, coincidentally, as the pandemic hit, we were in the midst of doing some long range planning for the future of the organization and the work that we do with people with intellectual developmental disabilities. And we are really excited uh, to share with you this afternoon on our new strategic plan. We call it strategic framework for the future of the art. As you'll hear, this plan lays out our vision for the future of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and how we are going to work with and for their, them, their family members and supporters to make that vision a reality. So before we jump into the details of the plan, um, we wanna emphasize that uh, developing this plan was really a true participatory process in, in the classic way we do things in the ARC. There are literally thousands of stakeholders just like you from both within and outside the ARC network led by a 24 member long range strategic planning committee. Uh, more than 4,000 people participated in a national stakeholder survey. We interviewed about 60 leaders from the disability community, the business community, uh, the nonprofit sector, other civil rights organizations. There were more than 18 large and small group meetings held both online and in person at our various different events. Uh, so we really wanna thank all the volunteers and staff leaders that were involved in this process. Really thanks to everybody that participated. The plan was adopted against the backdrop of the arts mission. And the, the mission hasn't changed. The mission, the ARC's mission is to promote and protect the human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and actively support their full inclusion and participation in the community throughout their lifetime. What is new is the vision. The vision is how we imagine, how we think about what the world will look like when we achieve our mission. We have stated that simply in a way that we think everyone can embrace. The ARC's vision is for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to be valued members of their communities with the opportunity to realize their potential and a future that is secure. That's worth repeating. Let me repeat that. The ARC's vision is for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to be valued members of their communities with the opportunity to realize their full potential and a future that is secure. So Fred, we're seeing notes in the chat that your video, your audio is garbled, um, fading in and out. I don't know if you want to try to uh, okay. sign off and sign back in again. All right, we'll try People to. People are having difficulty uh, and I'll just keep us moving forward while you do that. That's okay. Um, you know, for Fred was just talking about the vision and we think, you know, one of the things um, we feel really good about is we think that the vision as Fred just stated it, it um, that it's simple, it's understandable, um, it, that it can be easily embraced by self-advocates, by parents, by siblings, 
by professionals and uh, by supporters um, in that it really communicates a lot in one short sentence. Um, it, it makes me think of um, our colleague at the National Office, William Washington. Some of you may have met him over the years at convention for those of you who are involved in, in the ARC. Um, I'm reminded uh, uh, about uh, you know, the way William has really managed within the District of Columbia community to build a full meaning life that is meaningful to him. Uh, he's our receptionist at the Nas national office. He's a resident of the District of Columbia, fully involved in his community, living the life he wants, and he has plans for the, for the future. So hopefully better everyone you, can hear me now. Much better. Right. So everyone was excited about the vision, but that really leaves the hard question of how are we going to get there? After reviewing all the input we received, we came up with four goals that we think express and represent the collective wisdom of our stakeholders. The idea of goals is that we work constantly to achieve them. And if we are successful, then the vision becomes a reality. So let me share them with you. The ARC's first goal is for every member of society to recognize and respect the human dignity of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Second goal is for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is to be masters of their own lives and destinies with help from family, friends, and other supporters if needed. The third goal is for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families to have timely access to the quality supports and services they need and want to achieve a life of personal significance. And finally, the fourth goal is for the ARC to be even stronger, more diverse force for change, capable of wielding power with and on behalf of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families at the local, state, and national level. You know, we were really excited when we put these goals out for comment. They were really fully embraced by our constituents, our stakeholders. Uh, when we asked, do you agree that these are good goals for the ARC and that um, working on these goals will move us toward achieving the vision? Nearly everyone, uh, from 80, 86% to 96%, depending on the specific goal we were asking about, nearly everyone agreed or strongly agreed with the goals. I have to tell you, though, frankly, we weren't surprised because the idea for these goals really surfaced strongly in our national stakeholder survey um, and other information gathering uh, that we did. Um, take, take goal one, for example, that every member of society recognize and respect the, uh, the human dignity of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We heard repeatedly in our interviews and meetings uh, that among the general public, um, there's a lack of respect for the humanity of people who have an intellectual or developmental disability. And that's one of the big barriers that we face as a community. And our National Stakeholder Survey really bore that out, as you can see from the slide here, more than 87% uh, of our survey respondents agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that the human dignity of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is often not respected in our society. In a, in a summary of our uh, stake, stakeholder survey is available on our, on our website. So that's a very important uh, uh, piece of information to go through. We don't have time to go into detail uh, this afternoon about all we've learned, but the summary and the results are available on our website. Of course, the strategic framework itself is, is also on our website. We'd like to tell you a little bit more about the strategies that we developed that we're going to use to pursue these goals. The strategic framework has five strategies and let's review them now. Strategy one, build the movement. The ARC will organize and mobilize a more powerful movement of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families and supporters to be activists for change. And, um, and this strategy too was really driven by our stakeholders. In our national stakeholder survey, 
85% of the survey respondents stated that it was highly important to them to be part of a nationwide movement dedicated to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, strategy two re, uh, is speak truth to anyone who will listen and those who will not. The ARC will work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families to amplify their stories, call for recognition of their human dignity and the day-to-day -day challenges they face, affirm their abilities and contributions and demand change. The, um, the Traverso family uh, provides a great example here. We with, worked with our uh, one of the chapters from the ARC New York, the chapter in Nassau County, New York, to get 80-year-old Harriet Traversa and her 49-year-old son, Sal, on the Today Show. And they told their story about the hard choices that families uh, had to face as a result of the suspension of services during the pandemic, the isolation, the challenges in understanding and protecting yourself from, from the virus. Strategy three, advocate. The ARC will aggressively advance the interests of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families before the executive and legislative branches of government and in the courts and influence the practices of other private and public sector organizations. Now, a young man named uh, Neelai Lotson comes to mind here. Lotson, who has autism, has experienced continuing injustices horrifying mistreatment in the criminal justice system in Virginia. He became entangled in the system because of behavior directly related to his disability. And frankly, the fact that he was a young black man didn't help his situation. The ARC's legal advocacy team, along with others, are working hard to persuade the governor of Virginia to grant Latson a full pardon, and we will continue to do so. Strategy four. Extend our reach. The ARC will expand and sustain our presence as a critical part of the fabric of every community where people with intellectual and developmental disabilities live. Strategy five, innovate. The ARC will capitalize on the collective knowledge and creativity of our Federation of Chapters to envision, pilot, and implement new and improved programs, supports, and services and to create new opportunities for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families that they need and want. So the idea here is that if we implement these strategies, we pursue these strategies to the fullest of our ability as a federation, that that will help us achieve our goals and then draw us closer to making our vision a reality. So we start with goals. We go to strategies and the next step are tactics. We frankly don't have time to go into the next level of detail with respect to tactics. There's 43 tactics we've identified in total, which uh, explain more specifically some of the things we're gonna do with respect to each strategy. However, there are some themes that you'll see in the tactics that I would like to mention. First, you will see a lot of references to reaching out to and engaging diverse communities and bringing inter intersectionality into our work. By that, I mean, we need to learn about disability and how it is experienced by those who are also part of other marginalized communities, such as racial, ethnic, religious minorities, LGBTQ plus individuals, and to factor that knowledge into our work. Second, you will see an emphasis on expanding our relationships with business in industry and professional associations, with civil rights and human rights and social justice organizations, with social services and religious groups and more. And finally, certainly not, not least, you'll see an emphasis on the chapter network and the central role it plays in everything, everything. That, that the ARC does. So in closing, we want to invite all of you to join the movement and work with us to achieve the future we seek for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. For now though, let me turn the floor back to Kristen for questions and comments from all of you. 
Okay, thank you, Peter and Fred. We do know how much effort and care and collaboration went into the strategic framework. And we think it really is an important uh, moment for the ARC and for people with disabilities and, and families. So thank you. So keep in mind that the strategic framework and the summary of the strategic framework, uh, the summary of this, the stakeholder survey um, are both on our website, which is the arc.org. So right now we wanna hear from you. So we've been getting a lot of questions coming in and we definitely wanna hear what's on your mind. So we invite you again, as a reminder to um, enter questions in the Q and A box uh, for the entire panel. You can also share thoughts through the chat function and then we'll try to get to uh, as many questions as possible. So I wanted to start with Shira because, and, and Julie, we have, a, we have a, a few questions coming in about education. And we know this is a big issue right now because of uh, the pandemic. And so there were a few questions that, that alluded to the question of what are we doing? What is the ARC doing? Um, to address the, uh, the uh, what, is, what is the ARC doing to address um, the challenges that school systems are facing right now, you know, when it comes to virtual learning versus at-home learning. And I don't know if Julia or, or Shira who wants to chime in first, uh, but that's a very serious thing right now because we all want the best for our kids uh, when it comes to education, but it's really a challenge right now. Absolutely. Um, and this is definitely one of the most common questions that we get. It's a, one of the biggest concerns. There's been, I think, a lot of media coverage on the, the needs of students with disabilities and, and the disadvantages that they're facing in this process with online learning. Um, so it's really a big thing um, and, it, and there's a lot of angles to it. Um, and it's just been an incredibly you know, challenging time to ensure that kids can meaningfully access the remote learning opportunities. So, I mean, I think one thing more broadly um, is like the most important thing I think to keep in mind uh, when you're dealing, when you're thinking about education is that um, the concept of the free appropriate public education or FAPE still applies no matter what. And, and just like we discussed with the medical discrimination, you know, it, it might be an emergency situation right now. A lot of things may have changed and be in flux that does not change the obligation of school districts under the law. Um, so that's one thing to always be keeping in mind uh, when you're advocating. Um, of course, it's hard to, uh, you know, say anything universal about this situation other than that in the sense that every school district uh, has different resources, is handling things differently based on a variety of factors that allows for the safety of students and teachers, also could be dependent on the infection rate in the community. Um, and so each student and family is really going to have to work with the school individually to reach a workable solution for their IEP and make sure they're getting the accommodations they need uh, to receive a FAPE during this time. Um, some examples of things that could be advocated for during times like these are, let's say, extended school year services were not delivered over the summer because of COVID. Schools could factor whether the offerings can be provided during the school year or during breaks or vacations. Uh, some schools are prioritizing in-person learning for students with disabilities uh, that need it uh, versus having uh, more online instruction for others. Um, so it really, but it really, turns to, it really turns on an individualized assessment of the student's needs. There's not really a blanket solution for all students in schools, but I think the, the most important thing to always be keeping in mind is that the law still applies. People's civil rights uh, still are just as worthy as being protected no matter what the situation, um, and we're doing everything we can to advocate for that. And another resource that, that we offer, this is not uh, from legal advocacy, but we have resources for uh, parent advocates uh, through our ARC at School website and resources, which I'm happy to put in the chat so people can see how to access that website. Uh, and hopefully that can be helpful as well. Hi, this is Julie. I just wanna chime in too that um, we have been fighting for dedicated funding for special education services um, throughout um, our response to the pandemic. Uh, we've not been successful. Congress has allocated additional education funding, but it's kind of been an open pot. So it has really been difficult um, for, you know, 
local chapters and state chapters to get in there and, and fight for some of the money to be used to meet the needs of kids who require services and supports. It's a very difficult situation that Shira acknowledged that we know not everyone can benefit from virtual learning. We know not everyone can benefit from virtual telehealth and virtual supports, but yet we know some people do benefit and finding the right balance and the right accommodations for people. And at, we're in a period of transition in a lot of areas um, where temporarily we've relied on a virtual world. And so there's gonna be a lot of policy and advocacy as we move forward um, to keep what works for people, improve what doesn't work for people and, and return to some of the things that we know are successful for people. So it's really a multi-pronged multi advocacy, individual advocacy and systems advocacy approach that we need. Yeah, okay. Thank you. A uh, question uh, for Claire. Uh, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It's so important that people be involved and really use, you know, their voice or if they don't speak with their voice, use their whatever they feel. It's important that they communicate that. So can you explain kind of like the best ways for people um, to do that? Sure. So there's a there's a couple of ideas that come to mind kind of an how to get involved with advocacy with the ARC, through the ARC, um, on the state and local level, connect with your local and state chapters. You can find them at the arc.org slash find a chapter. Um, many of them likely have self-advocacy groups where you can get even more information about what's going on locally or on the state level and how to get involved. The ARC of the United States also has a National Council of Self-Advocates and a National Sibling Council, which are involved in advocacy. And we are actually going to be looking for new members for both of those um, very soon. Um, other ideas, each Wednesday, we have a, a little campaign that we call hashtag we Act Wednesday, where we post on Facebook and Twitter. So if you're on social media, you can see them, different ways to get involved in advocacy each week. Um, so for example, this week we posted some materials that we're asking people to read through on um, some new plain language voting materials from our partner, ASAN. You can always find our action alerts if you're kind of like, what's the latest, what's going on, you know, where do I find this? You can always find the latest action alerts at the arc.org slash action. And an action alert um, has talking points, um, a little bit of information about what the issue is. Julie mentioned earlier the, you know, the four COVID priorities. So our COVID advocacy alert, for example, has all of those listed out. Um, and it'll have like a sample email that you could send to your legislators, a sample tweet. You can always edit things, um, but we always have those samples available for you. And then the last thing that I want to mention is we have a training coming up. At the end of the month, as part of the ARC's national convention, we have what we're calling an advocacy power hour. It's going to be fun. Um, any, anyone is welcome to join. It's free. It will be October 27th um, at 5 p.m. Eastern. And you can find more information about that in our, con our national convention website and our national convention um, uh, planning doc. OK. Perfect. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to fix them. The sun is doing funny things and I look like I'm in a horror movie right now. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, so I, I, I want to ask a question uh, about direct support professionals because they really are the backbone in a lot of ways of, of, of our advocacy work. And so Julie, I wonder, you know, if you can kind of shed some light on what's going on in terms of our advocacy to make sure that we are keeping in mind direct support professionals and their needs and their really um, heroic actions a lot of times during this pandemic, because they've really been between a rock and a hard place, you know, trying to like do their jobs, protect their families. Um, so yes. What can you tell us about that? Well, I just want to, you know, reinforce, I briefly mentioned that um, addressing the concerns and supporting direct support professionals was one of our top priorities. And as part of the HCBS money that we're advocating for, it does include money to help address the turnover, the wage issues. We know people 
need um, to earn a living wage in order to do this work. And so we've been advocating for um, any of our approach to HCBS to include workforce issues. We've also really aligned ourselves with other advocates um, in the aging community, in the family uh, support community, um, across multiple generations to build, you know, we know that our voice is strengthened when we work together in coalitions. So we do coalition work on almost every issue we work on, but we've been very involved in the last year and a half, two years in really trying to bring more attention to the workforce issues impacting children, people who are aging, people with disabilities, um, because we know it's a critical issue in nearly every state and we need to provide whatever critical federal support that we can to address the multitude of issues. Um, it is included in the framework of what we're advocating for, but I did wanna call it out because I know how critical it is to families, to individuals and chapters. It is. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, Shira, what is the ARC doing to address uh, social isolation, which is a huge problem of people with disabilities that has resulted, for example, from no visitor policies? Yeah, I would say this and education are really the, like some of the top issues that we've been hearing concerns about during COVID. Um, and so I discussed a little bit, um, you know, in the main presentation about the work that we've done to make sure that hospital no visitor policies um, are allowing for accommodations for people with disabilities and ensuring that uh, supporters can, can come uh, with their family members or those they are supporting um, to help ensure effective communication or other supports that are needed. Um, but another question that we often get is around other settings um, where uh, visitation has been limited, for example, um, ICFs, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, et cetera. So those are definitely in a somewhat different category because for in general, the staff there is trained to support and accommodate people with disabilities and they actually know uh, the people with disabilities um, on a longer term basis um, and can, you know, theoretically support them as needed. That being said, uh, there's been a lot of, you know, restriction to the outside world, as you can imagine, with the no visitor policies because of outbreaks in these facilities and things like that. Um, and people are really concerned about family members and others that are not able to see them during this time because of those limitations. Um, so there has been some advocacy around beyond the hospital setting on advocating uh, to get more guidance on those issues um, and to, to make sure that accommodations are being provided when needed, but also taking safety, health and safety into account given the outbreaks in, in these uh, settings. Um, towards that end, CMS uh, recently issued a guidance document about visitation to nursing homes, which expands compassionate care visitation addresses visitation rights for ombudsmen and protection and advocacy organizations to make sure that they can still do the monitoring that's needed uh, and discusses when modifications to visitor restrictions are required under the ADA and 504. So it's not as straightforward necessarily as the accommodations that are needed uh, for supporters to visit hospital settings, um, but we are doing everything we can uh, on that front as well to try to reduce the social isolation keep everybody healthy, but also make sure that people are able to access the community and their family members and other supporters as, as much as they possibly can. And Shira, do you happen to know um, when OCR has issued these resolutions, do you know if states are doing what they're supposed to be doing, if they're following up and, you know, taking the corrective actions and proactive, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, it's always a good question. <laughs> That's what we're here for, to try to help uh, push that process along. Um, I would say that with a lot of the work that we've done and, and all of the publicity that has come out through, especially through OCR and national agencies kind of taking some ownership there and really taking a leadership role and saying what's prohibited and disability discrimination is still prohibited during the pandemic and there aren't exceptions to that. Um, you know, I think that has really sent a strong message. That doesn't mean that advocacy is not still needed. There's a lot of specifics, of course, to work out there beyond just follow the law. 
Um, and of course, some states have been, you know, more willing than others to kind of change some of these plans more proactively. So we still have a lot of work left to do on that front, but we have seen a lot of progress as well. And I think uh, partnership with OCR and all of the, the leadership that they've taken has been really, really helpful in pushing states uh, to do the right thing. Okay, that's really important. Um, I don't know if Peter or Fred, if you want to like jump in with anything you know, related to the strategic framework and um, just maybe how like situations like this pandemic, which hopefully we'll never experience again, but crisis situations and how, you know, you hope that the strategic framework will be kind of a guide in terms of getting through those situations. Sure. You know, we had it was it was really interesting. Um, Fred mentioned earlier we were just cu coming off of um, uh, a, a 10 year strategic framework, the strategic framework uh, for the future of the arc 2010 to 2019 um, that uh, we developed right after I arrived as the CEO in, in 2008. Um, and our committee this time around um, actually spent a, a fair amount of time discussing what's the right time frame for this strategic strategic framework? Is it 10 years? Is it three years? Is it five years? And you'll note when you look at the look at it, there is no specific time specified. You know, the idea is that this is intended to be um, a living document and that, you know, every year we've got to take, uh, take a look at it, uh, you know, in the course of our planning, but the board and the staff, every year we've got to take a look at it and ask ourselves, uh, is it still relevant, and uh, do we need do we need to to uh, change it, uh, you know, and re retool our approach? You know, I think we think that most likely um, the uh, you know tactics are going to change change more often. The strategy is probably second, um, and, and the goals maybe have a little bit longer uh, shelf shelf life. Um, but you know, particularly in the in the wake of COVID and in the wake of all the unrest we're seeing around police brutality and and uh, you know racial um, um, injustices, uh, we have to um, be ready to pivot um, and you know be responsive to the circumstances that we are we are living in at any particular time. I would add that when we were going through the strategic framework planning process and seeing the, the murder of George Floyd and, and, and seeing the civil unrest and the, and the action of so many citizens who otherwise would be in their living rooms, right? The people who moved to action to take to the streets. We began to reflect the fact of the great intersectionality between the experiences that our community has with respect to families being the backbone along with the direct support prof pro professionals and, but access, you know, inequality of healthcare, uh, uh, really harsh treatment of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in correctional facilities and in custody, uh, the impact, the, the, the real thin margins that people are facing with income and wealth, that our interests, there's a great mutuality of interest between the, the, the disability world and other communities. And I think one of the things that really strengthened the strategic framework planning process, a recognition that we have to kind of think about getting out of the silo that is the disability world into a greater, broader movement of shared values and shared interests within our country. And I think if you look at the million of people, the million people we serve every single day, that's a huge network, but if you buttress that with other communities who have very similar shared experiences as our community, I think you know it really spoke to the, the strategic framework planning process, and that's why you see some of the things that are that's in the strategic framework. Okay, thank you both. Um, one last question uh, before we move on to our closing remarks, and I think this is a good one for Claire. Um, in a world where, you know, uh, pre-COVID, I guess, interest in, you know, how things are publicly, how things are impacting the disability community in a world where pre-COVID, that was all very limited. Um, wonder, like, how can we break through in terms of um, education, in terms of reform, in terms of 
informing people of what's going on and making sure that people are, are engaged and having a feeling a sense of uh, the importance of their participation. Uh, where do you see that going next? How do we really like, you know, keep that keep keep that going? I think that's a really big and really critical question. It's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about at the ARC. It's something that I know our chapters spend a lot of time thinking about. And I think the strategic plan really gets to a lot of that. The bottom line is we have to bring more people into our movement. More people have to be engaged, have to be involved, have to understand the lives of people with disabilities and what it takes and the supports needed to live independently in the community. And I believe that there are so many people who support disability rights, but maybe they don't know about the ARC, they don't know how to engage, they don't know how to get started. And it's our job to help them do that, to bring them in. And I think, I think that we have had a lot of success here. I think, you know, a great example, as Kristen shared, we've had a ton of really, really, really big um, media successes with sharing stories. And that matters because that's, that's out of kind of our echo chamber. That's out of the disability community and into the broader community. And, and as more people are educated and hear different perspectives, they're like, oh, what's the arc? Or how do I get involved? Or I didn't know about this. And that is so critical. You know, we've also done a lot of work in the last couple of years on um, paid social media campaigns. Um, we have worked on Facebook and Twitter to get our messages and our messaging and our action alerts in front of a broader community. And we have had a lot of success there as well, um, but there is a lot more to do on this. Um, thank you for the question. And as I said, I really think that I'm excited about the strategic plan and I think that it starts to get at a lot of this. Yeah. Well, Peter, were you going to add, uh, add something? No, I was just going to tell you to unmute. <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> Thank you. I take direction well. This is, I was I was type I was looking at my name and I didn't understand why I didn't unmute. Over the last hour and uh, fifteen minutes, uh, we've been uh, provided you with a glimpse of the ongoing work of the ARC, and uh, as well as a look at the ARC strategic uh, framework. On behalf of the board of directors. Uh, and our members, thanks to Peter for his leadership, uh, to Julie and Shara and Claire for participating in this, as well as to Kristen Wright for organizing and moderating uh, this event. Now the question is, and it's been asked during this session, uh, how can you become more actively engaged with the art? Uh, and how can you work with our chapters to advance our vision? I encourage you to get involved with your state and local chapters. Also, please stay current on all of the communication that comes through uh, at the, from the national office on a regular basis, and also the strong social media presence that we have. There is there's no getting away from the ARC if you really are looking for it. There's tons of ways of, of being involved. To achieve our mission, it is going to take the efforts of you, everybody here, your friends and colleagues who can't, didn't, weren't able to attend the webinar, and many, many people uh, to achieve our mission. And each of us has a role to play at all levels of our organization and in your communities. Frankly, a very important part of this effort is to vote in the upcoming election. Claire spoke of it. Um, it, it, it that's probably the most important thing that we, we, we should be uh, doing. Up and down the ticket, up and down the ticket from president, to Senate, and House of Representatives, governors, state legislatures to local officials, mayors, city and town councils, school committee people, learn about their platforms, their views. And while we're a nonpartisan organization, look, our core values are clear, crystal clear. And, we, and I encourage you to support candidates and work for candidates and support who support our values and our priorities. So uh, stay safe. Uh, thank you all for attending this and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you.